Okay. <coughs> Thank you all for coming. My, my name is Alan, Alan Malloy, and uh, yeah, I'm very, yeah, very grateful that you're all here and that uh, you, you come to make the effort to take a bit of time out from your busy lives to do something uh, maybe a little bit different uh, for life. Um, yeah, it's good, isn't it? Med Meditation's something a little bit different. It's, uh, you know, we've got uh, Christmas coming, haven't we? <laughs> What's the only problem with Christmas? Shopping. <laughs> Shopping's the only problem. <laughs> and then, uh, that's so much suffering shopping. Huh? So, so <laughs> instead, you're not shopping, which is lovely <laughs> for at least one hour between now and Christmas you're not shopping so that's real peace <laughs> a little bit of peace you don't have to go online even you don't have to do anything you just have to because um, yeah, the only thing wrong with Christmas is probably shopping isn't it really so, and, and that's what we'll be talking a little bit about tonight as we, as we go through the topic is uh, the role that uh, attachment and desire has in uh, creating problems for us and creating uh, uh, the yeah, dissatisfaction, really. And what are we trying to find in, in meditation? Well, I suppose we're trying to find a very simple satisfaction, aren't we? It's really simple. Well, what could be more simple and satisfying than to be um, than to be content with yourself? Uh, to get, yeah, I mean, yeah, content with yourself, content in yourself, a certain amount of contentment with yourself. Uh, not that you, know, you haven't got a few problems that you've got to deal with, but, but in a certain sense it may be being able to find some contentment which isn't dependent on external things. Because external things are unreliable. You know, they come and go, the, you know, people, they come and go. Uh, you know, environments come and go, jobs come and go. Families come and go, friends come and go. So, so even your body, if we talk about that as something like external, even that is totally unreliable. It can let you down. One day it can do something very well, and the next day it can't. Even your mind, even your mind is pretty chaotic, isn't it? Your mind is chaotic. It's uh, one day it can be, oh, look, I feel peaceful, and the next day, tremendous like anxiety or, or stress or depression, and prevents even thinking straight or you can't even sit down you can't even sit can't even enjoy a meal you can't even enjoy a meal you're sitting there even the food you're too sort of like too agitated or, or too uh, depressed or, or too angry or too sad to even enjoy food so that's what, what the mind can do can, can mind can rob you of even even the ability to taste food or to um, to sleep or, or to enjoy even sunshine on, on a nice late spring evening, you know, that, that, that's what the mind can do, it can rob so much pleasure. And in meditation, we're, we're just trying to maybe get some control of that mind. Can't really control the body, I mean, the body, you can try, I mean, try to sit still, that, that, that's a good start, we'll try to sit still, I mean, you don't have to sit like, you know, a Egyptian sphinx, you know, you just, here, yeah, we're sitting here, so the body not going anywhere. For the next hour, you're not going anywhere. That's good. But the mind, wow, the mind can be everywhere. Woo, the mind can be the end of the universe. The mind's in Southland. The mind's shopping. The mind's thinking about tomorrow. The mind's at home. The mind's... Oh, yeah, mobile phone. Turn off the mobile phone, please. Turn off your mobile phones. Because that is really where the mind's going all the time, isn't it? Yeah, so we... Yeah, so so the, the mind is a lot like controlling us. The mind is, is out of control. So um, in meditation we try to rest back. We say, whoa, whoa, the mind, you know, the, let's, I, I, me, uh, you, we, uh, all of us individually, we all have a mind. Um, it's fundamentally probably the, the greatest cause of all our problems. And, and it is, I believe, the, 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 the real cure, uh, the real essential perfect uh, cause or a perfect sort of uh, secret 
to all our happiness and the happiness of others too. So that, that's a secret, that the mind is like this perfect secret source of happiness. And why is it secret? Well, we're told so often that happiness is external. We're told to you, you must have this, you must look like this, you must earn this much money, you must have this, you must have this sort of friend, you must have this sort of uh, Instagram account and Facebook and blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. We're told this, but the, the, the real secret, what's so secret is that that's wrong. That's wrong. The, the real cause of happiness is something internal and that comes from the mind and developing states of mind that bring you happiness, irrespective of what's going on. And that can be a bit crazy, you know, you say, oh, what, you know, my life's falling apart, uh, my, my relationship's gone, I'm doing, I haven't got enough money, I haven't got a job, I'm, done, I'm in chaos, everything. You want me to tell me that, you know, focus on my mind to be happy? Well... No, of course not. I mean, we all need food, we all need shelter, we need safety. I mean, you, you see, I mean, it's impossible. Impossible to really... Well, no, no, no it's not impossible. You can still... I've, learnt, I've worked with many refugees. I'm sure many people in this room have. And uh, when you talk to those sort of people, you know, even coming from, you know, war and uh, torture. I've even known many people have been tortured, uh, physically tortured, mentally too, I suppose, but physically tortured. And it's still... It's possible for even in those situations of intense depravity and uh, inhumanity that yeah, you can still have uh, uh, like a, a positive mind, like a mind of compassion and love can develop. Many, many times I've heard the stories or talked to people and, and read the stories of great, uh, great practitioners who've been able to transform even torture or, 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 or sorrow, incredible sorrow, incredible pain death and uh, destruction into a path to attaining some sort of perfection. So it's possible. So th that's why the secret, uh, this is the secret cause of happiness, is the mind. That's the secret. It's, it's, uh, and if you tell people that, they'll probably cut you down pretty quickly out there. <laughs> if you go into Southland or Chadston, uh, get up and say, the real cause of happiness is not shopping, it's the mind. <laughs> security will probably escort you out very quickly because you'll be very bad for business. <laughs> very, very bad for business. But uh, unfortunately, it is, it is true. It is true. And when you look at the faces of people who are shopping in Southland and, and Chatsun, there, there's not much happiness. Whereas even now, as I look at you people, as your minds are coming, you're all smiling. It's very nice. It's very nice to have a room full of people smiling at you. And, uh, yeah, in a, in a positive way. <laughs> So uh, it is good. So, so that's what meditation It's very simple, isn't it? In actuality, it's just being simple. Uh, and I don't mean simple in being stupid. I mean, uh, elaboration. We talk about numtog. It's called conceptual elaboration, the Tibetan words numtog. And we, we spend our life perpetually in a state of conceptual elaboration. That is thinking that things are something they're not. That's what conceptual elaboration is. So I think you are out to get me. You've said something, and it's really, you know, I believe you are out to get me. Your 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 intention is to harm me. You're you're jealous. You're you're spiteful, or whatever. And then I react, and that's my total fantasy. Or I believe you really, really like me, and you want me, and you need me, and da 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 da. And, this is, and that's my fantasy too. Or I believe I'm worthless. I believe, I, I am worth it, I have nothing, I have nothing to offer, I have no potential to achieve anything, I can be of no use to anybody or any being, and that is fantasy too. So these fantasies we live with in the world are at uh, the power of conceptual elaboration, numtog, which is perpetually we're engaging. It's exhausting, it's demeaning, it destroys you and it creates problems with other people. If we just simplify our processing of experience and people to a few basic principles, and then uh, um, then but life, life's a lot a lot less a lot less dramatic. I mean, we don't need drama. Uh, well, maybe some people like a bit of it, but we don't actually need it. And eventually, you grow tired of it. You really just want some few basic things. You want two basic things. You want to be happy. You want to avoid suffering. What does the person beside you there want? They want happiness. They don't want suffering. 
And all our actions, all our reactions, are to follow those two basic principles. Now, the second basic principle is, if that's, if that's the context in which we, in which we exist, to, to seek happiness and to avoid suffering, then where do we go wrong because we haven't achieved that? And it's really simple, where we've sought the wrong causes. We've been seeking the wrong causes to achieve happiness, and we've been seeking the wrong causes to avoid suffering. That's because we go external, too much reliance on external things, and, and too much conceptual elaboration about trying to overthink stuff instead of just focusing on the mind. So, meditation. What is it? Meditation, the Tibetan word is gom, which means uh, familiarity. So we have to be familiar with something. There, we need an object with which we can become familiar, and then we focus upon it. As we do this, this whole conceptual elaboration thing uh, reduces in intensity and we get a sensation of peace and stillness because overthinking is exhausting I mean I'm sure you you do these MR functional MRI scans and, and you see the the, 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 you know, the intensity of human emotions and we can extrapolate from that that right, you, the body is actually using a huge amount of just phys sheer raw physical energy and, and juice just to create stuff when we simplify it, then you know, that, that juice can be used maybe for a different sort of person, you know, that, that the energy can be used for different purposes, more positive purposes, instead of like spinning around, becomes quite intense and strong. So, and uh, yeah, so, so, so that's what meditation, it means to be um, uh, familiar, but sometimes we need an object with which we're familiar. We can't just say, oh, let's meditate on something you've never heard of before. Now, in these classes, for those who've been coming and for those of you who've done other, other things, I'm sure many of you have done meditation before, done different techniques. There's all sorts of different techniques because there's no one, there's no one, like for an object upon which you must meditate. You can meditate on anything, but there's a couple of caveats. If it's some, it, it should be something that really, I think, cultivates the mind into positivity, into positivity, rather than something negative. And... Um, uh, or it should be something neutral. Normally it's the breath, which is a neutral object. So the breath is very neutral, it's breathing in and out of the breath. That's great, it's great. Especially when you're stressed out, or angry, or you're about to explode. Meditate on the breath. Just in and out the nostrils. And that's really, really good. It's like short circuits. It short circuits intense emotions. It's fantastic. It works, it's so easy, you can do it anywhere, anytime. So th that's really good. The other way is to meditate on something which is of its nature really positive. Now, we're Buddhists, so um, yeah, the, the Buddha is our founder from two and a half thousand years ago, and then we have all the other sort of great lamas and teachers and, and, and other Buddhas, because there were many, many Buddhas there. There wasn't just one, there's sort of like infinite Buddhas, because, um, yeah, time's infinite, and we've been going for, at this <laughs> process. Of, you know, trying to be happy and trying to avoid suffering for a hell of a long time. And we're going to keep doing that unless we break the cycle of that. And that's where the second part of this comes in, which is the cycle of existence and how to break it. And, and uh, that's when you learn the key, I suppose, to, to break the cycle. But otherwise, we're, we're going to keep, we have been, and we're going to keep going around and around in circles in existence, 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 trying to find birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, um, until we um, until we get exhausted, I suppose. <laughs> Have you got a question? Sorry, I'll just, you said um, the Buddha was around two and a half thousand yeah. years ago, you just think infinite Buddha, so yeah, yeah. you reconcile those two statements. Oh, what's there to reconcile? <laughs> no, sorry, you're right. Okay, this is, well, he's the historical Buddha, in this age, he was the one, two and a half thousand years ago, and he was the son of uh, the Shakya king at that time in um, you know, North India, Nepal area, born in Lumbini, and then uh, uh, died at uh, Kushinagar. That one. So he's historical. The one in all the books. Wikipedia. The one in Wikipedia. So there were ah, there were plenty before and there were, pl there were plenty after. He's actually the fourth Buddha of this fortunate age. This is where Buddhism gets really weird. Uh, you know, we've got this whole cosmology of stuff that, uh, 
it makes Genesis and Adam and Eve look like you know kindergarten stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah, yeah. So, in this fortunate age, there are, there are four teaching Buddhas. There'll be a thousand. He's number four. So, so this one was number four. There are male and female Buddhas too, gender neutral. So, it's um, anything goes. So, uh, uh, so yeah, he was the fourth one. We call him Guru Shakyamuni Buddha. Before that was Kanaka, uh, and the Kashapa Buddha. Then there was Kana, uh, I can't remember the names of the other two. So it said every like great amount of time, like eons, the, you know, because the Buddha's teachings aren't permanent. I mean, nothing's permanent. Nothing's permanent. So the Buddha's teaching started two and a half thousand years ago. They'll last about five thousand years. So we're halfway through the degeneration of the Buddhist teaching. And then there'll be a dark period where there's no Buddhist teachings and another Buddha, the fifth Buddha will come. And then his or her teachings will last for a certain period of time, then they'll go. And then there'll be uh, another, and then so in this cycle of uh, uh, this, uh, it's a fortunate eon they call it, there'll be, there'll be a thousand. So we're up to number four. Yeah, well, they're, they're certainly they're said to be degenerating at the moment because, um, yeah, I mean the Buddhist teachings are degenerating, and uh, and other things are degenerating. So, but uh, I don't know. It's so cosmic. This uh, I, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. You know, I can't. I mean, like the world, how the world, uh, the cosmology of it. I'm not that sort of fluent on the co cosmology of Buddhist philosophy, but it is pretty. Um, it's pretty strange. Um, doesn't fit. Yeah, I mean, some of it contradicts a lot what we know. But on the other hand, yeah, we're we're, we're conceptualizing things, and uh, yeah, who knows? Who knows? I mean, the Big Bang happened. In court to Buddhist philosophy, there were, there were many Big Bangs before that, and there'll be many Big Bangs. So I suppose for you and I at this point in time, that that's the, you know the big picture stuff. But but basically, most of us just want to get over our issues of today and here and now. So the Buddha. So, so let's get back to meditation. Meditating on the Buddha's image is really useful. But if you're not a Buddhist, you don't have to do this. You meditate on, on, on Jesus Christ. Then if you're a Christian, meditate on Jesus Christ. Beautiful. Or, or you know, a Jewish, a Jewish symbol or, or a Hindu symbol or a Muslim symbol, whatever. Whatever, um, it, whatever personifies perfection to you. And you know, the perfection of human possibility. Let's say that. And then, then that, that's that, that, that's really something good. I don't mean like perfection, like the big house in in Portsea or something. I don't mean that. Or or the beautiful wife, house, husband, car, dog, or whatever. I don't mean that. No. I mean the, the beautiful perfection of, of what the ultimate potential of, of human of, of, of human uh, possibility is. So in that case, it's the Buddha. So we actually meditate on the Buddha's image. Um, that is, is the so, but much smaller. <laughs> so that's a bit big. So imagine in the space in front of you, like about a bo they say about a body length in front and about the level of your heart, an image that high of, of the Buddha, and the Buddha is is in the aspect of a monk, uh, golden colour. Uh, monks have their right arm exposed to show they're not holding any weapons. And uh, they just have like a skirt sort of thing, and he sits in the in the meditation posture, and then um, uh, with the right hand touching the earth and the left in his in his hand. All these have symbolisms which we can't you know, don't have time to go into, but it's 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 good. Just by doing that is really positive. It's really good. Trust me, trust me, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, just, just just meditate on Buddha's image. It'll be good for you. Good karma, a good future rebirth, guaranteed. Otherwise, you get your five dollars back. If if, if 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 you have a bad bad rebirth, come that will give you five bucks. Myself, myself. Yes, okay. If you can find me. <laughs> so um, so now now why, why don't we do some meditation? Because that's why you're here. You're not here to see me talk. So uh, yeah. So you get comfortable. I'm sorry we haven't got enough seats, but you know. If you, if you want seats, you need to give us money to buy them. <laughs> well, we, we run out of money, so we haven't got enough seats. So if you want seats, you better give us some money and we'll buy some seats. So that, that, that's good. <coughs> so that's, that's, that's the pitch for uh, funds. <laughs> so um, uh, you get very comfortable. Now, okay, it's simple in the space in front of you. 
about a body's length away from you is the Buddha about yay high, about you know, hand span in front of you. It's just in space, just space, nothing else, there's nothing else. There's no, just that, just that in the mind. Let your mind become imbued with that. And what is the Buddha? The Buddha is the perfection of love, compassion, wisdom, patience, generosity, morality. And as you consider that, your mind transforms into that. You will beget a part of that. That's the secret. That's the trick. Okay, so now just for, you know, five or six minutes, just a little bit of meditation. First of all, just start by bringing your mind into the room. Bring your mind into the room. Then bring your mind into your body. And for the next six or seven minutes, the mind and the body do not separate. The mind and the body do not separate. Now in the space in front of you is the Buddha. Golden in colour, sitting in the Vajra cross-legged position. Just floating in space. The right hand touching the earth the left hand in his lap holding a begging bowl, wears the saffron coloured robes of a monk. His eyes are half open and looking at you with intense compassion, love, concern and generosity. For the first time in your life you are known completely and accepted for who you are. It is not totally, not contrived. So bask in that, and that sheer joy of a total oneness with somebody who accepts you. And meditate on the Buddha's image.
Okay. So just we'll go quietly just cease the meditation, but try to maintain that uh, like that delicate feeling uh, for the rest of the night. Um, yeah, okay, now it's the Buddhist philosophy section. <clears throat> okay, so, can you see that? No, you can't, it's too small, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's my second wish list here. I really wish we had a projector and a thing, I think I could show you this. Because that's the entirety of Buddhist philosophy in one little thing. Yeah, shame you missed out on that, but anyhow. <laughs> this is the wheel of life. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it's really, really special. If ever you get, you know, like sort of, I'll do a Google on it, the wheel of life, you know, Wikipedia, something like that, the wheel of life, the 12 links of interdependent origination. It, it is really amazing. You can just look at this and look at this and look at this and then just understand more and more about Buddhist philosophy. So it's a wheel. So um, the, the, it's got 12 links, it's called the 12 links of interdependent origination and that's how we enter into cyclic existence. Okay, you've probably heard the word samsara. Samsara is sand, scan, Sanskrit word for cyclic existence. Now it's it's a cycle because as we said, yeah, you know, we have birth and death, birth and death, birth and death and we've been doing that for its time without beginning and then it's, it's existence here. We take in existence and existence. But it's a specific sort of existence. It's the existence of, you know, due to contaminated actions and due to contaminated causes. So this talks about causes and effects. It's all about cause and effects, which is, in one way, we can talk about karma, how everything that, has, everything that arises has causes. So existence, our experiences in life come from causes. That in itself, that one statement, is really, really shocking. That that one statement can really shatter so many of, of our perceptions and misperceptions. Of to just understand that everything we experience comes from causes. It's not random. It's not random. Things happen via causes. And so the secret then is how do we uncover those causes? Well, the, in the 12 links of interdependent origination, We've been through a few of them already. So this is the last class, so we've got to zap through it, zap through it pretty quickly. That way you can, by the end of this, by nine o'clock, you've all attained like enlightenment and you don't have to come back anymore. <laughs> Very bad for business if you all get enlightened in one session, but anyhow, <laughs> it'll make our life a lot easier. We won't have to talk as much. Okay, so, so anyhow, the 12 links. The first link is ignorance. And then ignorance is a misapprehension, a misperception of reality, a misunderstanding of, of how things exist. From ignorance, which is the, the prime cause, the prime progenitor, then karma is created. Karma is actions. These actions leave a seed on consciousness. Then from consciousness comes the arisal of you know, the body and mind, which in this paradigm is called name and form. Once the body and mind are created, then comes the, the sensory perceptions, the eyes, the ears, the nose, tongue, mouth, body, and mental senses, so the, six, the five sensory and, and the one mental consciousness. When we have these, these, these perceptual consciousnesses, then we can engage and we can contact. That's, that's the next link, contact, is mean contact sensory and other experiences. From contact, then feeling arises. And with feeling, feeling can be, you know, attraction, aversion, or indifference. But in here, in the context of cyclic existence, it, it's attachment. It's a strong attachment. It's a strong desire. And that strong desire then f fuel or, or fertilizes, fertilizes that karmic seed, which was the number two on the 12 links, that karmic seed we've created. And it starts to fertilize it, and, and it starts to bring that, that, that karmic seed alive. Just like a seed that's in the ground, if we leave it there in, in dry ground, nothing will happen. But if we add some water and moisture and a bit of warmth and enough oxygen or something, then that seed will like start to, to swell. It won't be fully ripened, but it'll start to swell. And that's craving. That's the link, the link of craving. Then the next link is, is 
is grasping another stronger form of attachment which takes that fertilized seed and then brings it to the state where it's going to inexorably it will definitely sprout and form its fruition it will it will fruit it will definitely do that and that um that uh, that is the uh, dependent link uh, of, of craving grasping. Then the final fruition of that seed, when it forms the new existence, uh, forms that new life. It, well, it's actually not the new life. It's actually the last moment of this life, because this is actually all to do our experience. This is actually when we're dying. This is what I'm explaining to you is what happens when you die. When you die, you will generate some sort of feeling, and that feeling will have attachment attached to it. And that attachment, which is in the form of craving and grasping, will ripen a seed on your continuum, in your mind. And then when that seed is fully fertilized and fully about to, about to flourish, then that seed will definitely become the, the tenth link of existence, which is the cause for your next life. So in this life, we are fertilizing, promulgating, propagating, so it's at the time of death in particular then uh, that seed which will bring us into the next life and the force behind it is well ultimately it's ignorance and karma and that but the final cause which brings the final fruition of this karma and will bring us into the next life and will choose a specific karma to take us to our next life is going to be these forms of attachment which are craving and grasping when that final karma is completely fruited and it's going to fruit that's the tenth karmic link of existence and then the immediate fruition of that is the next life and that's rebirth that rebirth so that first moment of rebirth which is the eleventh link and then immediately after that comes aging and then death and then we start the cycle again there's the ignorance which creates karma on consciousness which creates the, the body and mind which creates the six sense powers which creates contact with sense objects which creates feeling which then creates craving grasping and this time they fertilize another karmic seed and that throws us to a different life so there's rebirth then there's aging death and then there's ignorance causes karma which causes the you know, lies on consciousness and then that's fruit so so this cycle goes on and on and on it's a specific cycle for rebirth because at one way, at every moment of our lives, we're creating karma. So you being here is creating karma. I mean, you've made very conscious decisions to be here. So it's come with a lot of thought and a lot of effort and you've come here to create virtue. So every moment you're here, you're like creating the predispositions for virtue. Meditating on the Buddha's image, even if it's totally wacky, is really positive and will lead to, to, to future benefit. For example, it's said at that moment of death, so when we have the ninth, uh, the, the, the eighth and ninth links there, the craving and grasping, if that craving and grasping um, was like if towards like the Buddha's image, then that will fruit a karmic seed that's really positive and that next life will be very beneficial. So if we we're able to generate for example, the mind of taking refuge in the Buddha at death, then immediately that will fruit very positive karma, which means our next rebirth will be very good. Alternatively, if, at, uh, if that craving and grasping process is very torturing and very brings up a lot of pain and negativity, then that will uh, create a, a, a really negative uh, karmic seed to be ripened and then the next rebirth will create suffering. So that's it. <laughs> so how do we get out of this cycle? How this goes? Well, since everything is causes and results, then we look at the causes. The prime, the primordial cause is ignorance, and from that we create karma. So if we, if we just dwelt on that, that, that would be enough. If we could cut it at that level, so roots, uh, the, the, the first and second one, that'd be ace. We, we, we'd nail it here and now. All you would have to do is get rid of ignorance, and this whole cycle stops. It's pretty hard to do that. It takes a process. I'm sure, I'm sure it can be done, but it's a, it's a process. So karma, 
is, is another thing we can work at. And we've had some discussions on karma and how to create virtuous karma. And then as you go through the process, then we, we now the, the eighth and ninth link are, are craving and grasping, which are forms of attachment. So I thought tonight we'd talk a little bit about attachment because this is actually really, really like useful. It's not like this is cosmic sort of stuff like rotating and psychic existence. And I mean, that's, you can believe this or not. It's not obligatory. You don't have to. But what, what you, you really, really should believe is something, understand a little bit about attachment because we're really suckered to believe that attachment's really good and everything around us is telling us that attachment as a state of mind is really, really fantastic and useful and beneficial. And the Buddhist paradigm is... Uh, complete opposite. <laughs> no, attachment's uh, really sort of quite a negative thing that causes a lot of suffering and pain in life. But first of all, before we do that, uh, what is attachment? I mean, what is attachment? Um, the attachment in the strict Buddhist definition, and this is where if we get it this sort of right, then the conversation becomes more clear, becomes clear. Okay, well, wh wh what is attachment? Attachment's a state of mind which perceives a contaminated object and exaggerates its good qualities and then wants to possess it. Okay, I'll go through again. Attachment is a state of mind which exaggerates the good qualities of a contaminated object and then wants to possess it. There's a lot of stuff in that. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's three basic things. Okay, it perceives a contaminated object. A contaminated object is an object that is created from contaminated karma and delusions or negative states of mind. So, the Buddha. Is the Buddha a contaminated object? Nah. The, the Buddha is created from um, pure karma and there's no ignorance, no delusion. So, being attracted to the Buddha is not attachment. Ah, because it doesn't fit the definition. Because it's not contaminated. Love, pure love, pure compassion, pure wisdom, being attached to, being, you know, really attached to or desiring those, uh, are they, is that sort of what we call desire attachment? And no, 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 because they're, they're not contaminated objects. And also, we, we, uh, the, the second part of the, the, the definition is over exaggerates the qualities. This is what, when we talk a little bit about the being about num tog, this conceptual elaboration, every perception we have. There are decisions we're making, there are imputations we're putting on, there are qualities we're putting on things, and they are fabrications. When we're angry at somebody, we see that object or we perceive that object as negative. We see negative qualities. When we're attached to that object, we see positive qualities that are over-exaggerated. There may be something there, but they're over-exaggerated. And then having perceived those over-exaggerated qualities, then we want to attain. We want to attain. Okay, it's 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 a little bit complex. Okay, so so then, okay, that, so that's attachment. If we just keep on that, then we can see where the conversation goes. So, striving here. You've come here today to develop uh, your mind and to you know, develop peace. That's okay. That's a, that's okay. That's a, that's, a, that's like a valid aspiration. But when we are so totally overcome by desire and, and attachment, then it actually creates problems. So we've got to look at what sort of problems that desire and attachment can, can bring us. And then, you know, then have a think, well, maybe this isn't a problem. Okay, Christmas is the big one. We've got Christmas. What does it do? Well, well the, does, it, does that, you know, we're sort of provoked by it all the time, aren't we? You know, buy, 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 all that sort of stuff. Is that creating sort of peace, harmony, tranquility? Uh, I, I don't know. If we're excessively attached to our body, so this body, I mean, it's useful. This body's you know, really got incredible usefulness, but if we're incredibly attached to the body, it is of its own nature impermanent. It's of its own nature, the nature of suffering. It's of the own nature unpredictable. So if we're incredibly attached to our body and we notice it, getting old or we notice that it gets sick or our partner doesn't find it attractive anymore what happens to us we become sad we become despondent depressed and, and so to suffering so attachment to the body attachment to the body of others what happens when we're attached to the body of others well it could be okay i mean fine if it's okay if it's kept in control and if there's 
some love there, then maybe you can sort of, you know, the love and attachment can sort of work together. And so I suppose this is good. So, so what's the difference between love and attachment? Because um, it's it, I think this is probably one of the greatest mistakes we make. Both love and attachment perceive the object as desirable. They're completely separate minds. One's a very positive mind and one's very negative. Both attachment and love perceive the object as desirable. So remember, attachment perceives a contaminated object and, ex and exceeds, is entranced by good qualities that don't exist and then wants to possess it. Whereas love, well, what is love? We perceive an object. Love is the wish for a living being to be happy, to make a living being happy. Completely different, completely different. Love is, is a sense of joy from just being able to fulfill having the wish to fulfill another being's needs. That, that, that's, that's what love is. Whereas attachment really has as its basic generator, how can my needs be fulfilled? How can you fulfill my needs? Whereas love is, how can I fulfill yours? So it's sort of simple, but both of them, it is, the problem is, is the first moment of perception is like endearment, both of it, or attraction. Both love and att att attachment have the perception of attractiveness. But then one wants to possess, you know, keep for one's own benefit. The other one sees that attractiveness as a vehicle to benefit the person. That's the difference. That's the difference between love and attachment. So I suppose, you know, that in our normal relationships in everyday life, and we're talking about human, let's talk about human human relationships, because that's sort of the one that causes the most pain. And so it'd be great to get some ways uh, to, to, to deal with this. Um, uh, in human-human relationships, is a mixture. There's, there's very few people who have pure love. There are probably even very few people who have pure, pure attachment. There's probably a little bit of human nature, even in the most beastie of, of, of sort of people. And, but, you know, so, so we live in, the, in this mixture. And relationships change. Maybe at the beginning there's intense attachment, and then you learn to love the person. Or maybe you, you sort of love a person, and then the attachment develops. I, I, I don't know. Or maybe you, it, it's, it's, it's this tug of war all the time, where one becomes really strong, and then there's arguments and pain, and then there's reconciliation, and, and the love becomes stronger. So it, it's a move. But wouldn't it? The basic, our basic paradigm, the Buddhist basic paradigm, is the less attachment there is, the more stability there'll be. Because attachment is fundamentally a delusion. What is a delusion? A delusion is to believe something exists in one way, but it doesn't exist in that way. So getting back to the initial definition, we believe something has these excessive good qualities, but they don't have them. So what does that mean? When reality strikes and we see the truth of the situation, then we're going to be disappointed. So this person, we've built this incredible construct. Oh, you're so perfect. You fulfill all my needs. I need you. I want you. You need me. I want you. you I want you. You need me. All that sort of stuff. And then as the perfections start to shake, and the perfections are shaking because of your mind, that's the same person out there probably, but because attachment has confabulated this image, then it's going to shake. It's going to fall. And the truth will be revealed and in that truth will be ugly. Now, meditating on attachment. One of my first meditations, books I did when I was about 18 or 17 or 18, I went to the local library, the Campbell Library, and got a book on, on Buddhism and it was really very confronting. It was called the Cemetery Meditation. So what you did is, okay, these monks, they wanted to conquer their sexual attachment or other attachments. So actually, start with sex because that's a killer, isn't it? That creates so many problems. So we'll start with sex and then we'll work through the others. And they will go to the cemetery and watch bodies decompose. <laughs> Would anyone like to volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> we are already decomposing. I mean, our bodies are in a state of decomposition and recomposition all the time. I mean, if we look at the physiology, it's it's... We're barely held together <laughs> by, by the thinnest, thinnest shards, shards of 
physiological sort of we're, we're, otherwise we just fall apart we become like you know wouldn't we? if it all so anyhow let's go there so okay let's this is a text by Nagarjuna I spent a year studying this with some monks recently and there, there's one very good it's all about sex no this verse is all about sex so <laughs> that this verse is all about the rest of it's all about our stuff but it, it's really it's really this is really good we want to give you something that's useful. It's not just hairy fairy. So this is one verse from this text called Nagarjuna's Letter to a Friend. Nagarjuna was an Indian sage, and his friend was a king, a really powerful king. So he's talking to this really powerful king who had incredible power, and one of those powers he could he could sort of take anyone he wanted and use them or kill them or whatever. So he had tremendous power. So if, if you know, like we talk about all this sort of power imbalance in places and men, men in particular, but women too, sort of misusing their authority to, for sexual misconduct. Well, I mean, this, this guy was in a prime position, so, so Nagarjuna was trying to help him to say, look, don't do these sort of things because it'll cause suffering for you and for, you, and for your subjects and the kingdom, etc. So I'm just going to read you out this verse and then I'll quickly explain it and then, you know, you can, we'll meditate on it so you can deal with your own sexual issues in your own private mind. <laughs> you don't have to share them. <laughs> because I'll just give you the tool and you can go and dig around in there. Okay, this is verse 21 from the text. It's, it's really quite funny. Okay. Now, when I use the gender here, it goes to either gender because he was talking to a man. So if we want to say female can be male and male, female, etc. Okay, so the first, first bit of advice he says is do not look upon another's wife. So do not look upon another's partner. We'll say do not look and do not engage. So, um, however, should you see him or her, think of him or her according to their age, just as you would your own mother, daughter or sister. If lust persists, then meditate well on impurity. I'll go through this again and try to explain it very quickly. So do not look upon another's partner. I mean, what, what does it mean? It, it means um, the very... This is where the Buddhist understanding of, of, of perception and the effect mere perception has. If you just look at somebody, I look at you, sorry, <laughs> then you're making an, an effect on me. That mere perception of you and you... And then... The more I look at you, the more perception is going to be. And then the conceptual mind starts over there. I start fantasizing about you, or you, or you. And then that the more I do that, the more it's stronger it becomes, until it becomes like an obsession. And what is the worst type of attachment? It's that obsessive attachment, where you get sick, where you can't think, you can't breathe. Uh, so, that, so, that, so do not look. So first thing is do not look. When I was translating this with, an, with another translator, he, he, he used the word, he said, oh, Alan, I think it means ogle. Don't ogle. <laughs> I said, ogle? Yeah, don't ogle. Don't ogle you know, attractive women or, or men or something. That's what he's trying to get the point. So he actually, they don't engage too often. So you know, the, you know, the, 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 it's really, it's really, really quite good, you know, don't. Because that leads to fantasy. When, when you start engaging, as soon as you engage perception, the fantasizing mind takes over so quick like that. So don't look. Then, however, don't ogle, no ogling. And then, um, uh, however, should you see him or her, think of her according to her age, just as you would your mother, daughter, or sister, or we say father, son, or brother. Yeah, okay. So w what does that mean? This is, this is another one. Uh, and, uh, you yeah, know, like... Um, uh, you, know, you, you, you would hope that uh, you know if 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 a, if a woman was was you know, your, your daughter or something, you wouldn't feel sort of lust or something. And if she's your sister, you you wouldn't. Or if she's mother, you wouldn't. You know, you'd hope. So it's, so just think of um, you know the person to to whom you feel like intense you know, sexual desire to um, uh, as as being like uh, if she's older than you, she or she, he or she is older than you, like as your father or mother. If they're the same age as you, think of them as your sister or brother. And if they're younger, think of them as your child, your son or daughter. So, so that, 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 that's, uh, that's, that's pretty simple. I mean, that's pretty simple. These, these sort of things sort of work. I'll go, keep going. And then, if it still persists after that, I meditate well on impurity. So this is now we get nasty. Okay. So you're just a bag of pus and 
poo and blood, aren't you, really? So if we really wanted to look at this human body over which we are so attached and attracted, and for your own body too, take it apart. Take it apart. What's under the skin? There's blood and fat, and then you get to the muscle, and the, take that apart, and then you get to the bones, and then you got the liver. I mean, livers are not attractive, you know. <laughs> the spleen, even less so. The pancreas is downright disgusting. And let's talk about the colon. Okay, so 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 really, eh, not good. Yeah, not good. There's nothing there, is there? So so you know. Okay, th that's that's for the hard because that's when you're hardcore. Okay, so um, so th these are just this is just they're just too, the problem is we're so way over this side. We're so like oh everything's fantastic. Everything's Instagrammed. Everything's you know music videos on MTV. We're all so perfect. We got to drag it back from that. We need a really powerful tool to drag it back to this way, and so that we can get into the middle and find a balance where we can just coexist with ourselves and with other people in peace and harmony. That's what we're trying to do. So, okay, well, we're taking it a bit too far. But, um, okay, now you meditate. Now, this is a conceptual meditation. You have to do this yourself. You have to come up with your own example. I bet sex has caused you problems. I bet it has. I bet it has. So now we'll just meditate on... The, the, this is to deal with problems. Ideally, we can then take this and, and transform it into you know, something really positive like love. So then we'll, we'll just do this meditation. Like uh, you just think of a situation where you've been in, had intense problems with something. It could be someone you've lost, like your ex-husband, your ex-wife. It could be something like that or a partner who's left or someone who's scorned you or, or, or something like that or somebody you've hurt very, very badly. Very bad, badly could have hurt them. Out of uh, So... Uh, but now it's just going to be the perception. We'll do those three things. That's exactly as Nagarjuna said. He was perfect. He was a Buddha. So we'll just follow exactly what he said. And then at the end, we're going to ask the Buddha to bless us. So this Buddha image we had before, we're going to ask the Buddha, who's there already, we're going to ask the Buddha to bless us with like white light pervading through our body, to get rid of all the attachment and to fill us instead with just love, compassion for all living beings, rather than this infatuated attachment for myself and for others. It'll be love and compassion. So now, let's do the Okay, just get quiet for a second. I'll just make I'll just make some brief suggestions. So now. Yeah, you, you've all got in your mind, or in, in somewhere in your mind, the, the situation where intense obsession attachment to your own body or, or to that of another caused you problems. So just recreate how you felt, and then maybe the problems that caused you. Just briefly do that. Now we'll follow Nagarjuna's advice. The first one is just don't look, which means don't engage in that object. That pain that that person caused you or that object caused, if you had just not engaged with it, if it had not been in your mind, your mind would have been at peace. So just watch as your mind leaves the object that caused so much pain and then your mind becomes at peace by just not engaging with the object. So just don't look. No ogling.
Now, following Nagarjuna's advice, the second antidote is to meditate on that person. If they're older than you, meditate on them as your father or mother. If they're the same age as you, as your brother or sister. If they're younger than you, as your child, as your son or daughter. And see if that has an effect on the attachment you feel. Now the third aspect of Nagarjuna's advice is to meditate on the impurities and the filth. So as you dissect that body to which you are so attached, you peel away the skin, exposing the flesh, and peel away the flesh, exposing the organs, and peel away the organs, exposing the skeleton. And that is what happens to desire. Now in the space in front of yourself, visualize the Buddha. From the Buddha's heart comes a tube of white light. And in that tube, it connects, goes straight to the crown of your head. And through that tube comes white light, which pours in through the crown of your head, filling your whole body and mind. That light has the nature of love, compassion, wisdom, and all the perfected qualities completely fills your body. You are completely purified of attachment. Attachment, desire, anger and all other negativities. And your body and mind become blissful, clear light. Having the nature of the Buddha's love, the nature of the Buddha's compassion, the nature of the Buddha's wisdom. So just bask in that. Okay, so in your own time and space you can just sort of quietly relax and uh, so um, cool.
I'm nearly off duty. Yay. So, um, you've got, to, I mean, you have a question. <laughs> always get nervous with this. What question's going to come out of that? But if you've got a question, yeah, share it with anybody, with us. Hi, yes. You speak, could you speak quite loudly so we can all hear? Especially me. Oh, I would love you to, so we can all hear. Then you share your okay. ebullience upon us. I just want to know, yes. are the um, Monday night classes going on over the holidays, the Christmas period, the New Year period? They pretty much do. I think, yeah, yeah newsletter. Check out the newsletter. Oh, I can get Fantastic. That. Online, <laughs> ring the office. Yeah. Thank you for asking. But you won't get me. I'm out of here tonight. <laughs> I'm, I'm the last of me, yes, yes. <laughs> you get somebody much better next time. Yeah, hi. Sorry? Uh, I just made it up. Yeah, but I look, no, no, you don't, no, not really, no, I'm being facetious, sorry, I didn't make it up. You're not allowed, to, we're not allowed to make things up. No. It's got to be true, but it's, it's, okay. it's, it's sort of based on a lot of the Buddhist uh, sort of practices we do, and, um, and also has some um, relationship to tantric practice, but, but we're not allowed to talk about that. So it's sort of, but it's sort of like, but a lot of the, the Buddhist practices we do have purification, and we are trying to, what are we trying to achieve? We, we, the one thing that's just really, really exciting about Buddhism is we can achieve the state of Buddhahood. I mean, you know, I don't know if, if other religions say you can attain the state of God. I, I, I think they talk about a communion with or some sort of relationship with God. But no, no, we go the whole hog. We, we, we can actually attain the state of Buddhahood. So we believe, that, so by doing these sort of like meditations where we, we meditate on the Buddha and the Buddha's uh, blissful energy pervading us, we're actually starting to take some of that result of the Buddha, which we will one day achieve if we follow this path, we're actually starting to take it and taste it and experience some of it now. And it's really, really inspiring. It's really, really good. It's really, really healthy. It's really psychologically healthy. It's really a maturational process. It helps to mature things in your mind. So it's an okay, good thing to do. So yeah, look, we do have some, we do have various Buddhist practices um, in those folders and other things, and as uh, in some of the meditation uh, books in the, in, the, um, in the library, they've got a whole lot of meditation practices, and uh, you, you can learn some of these. But the, this meditation practice comes a little bit from Pabonka Rinpoche and from Lama Tsongkhapa, some of the great Tibetan, uh, sort of uh, great Tibetan teachers of this tradition. So it's very, very, very simple. Meditate on the Buddha, blissful light. Okay, one more. Hi. Is it, hi. Is it possible to recognise people who are in their second last life? Oh, is it possible to recognise people who are in on their, second life? their second last life? And if so, would they know they're on their second last life? Um, so, what's a person on a second last life? Uh, I, they're almost off the so on this up here. They're about to get off. Yeah. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, it's very interesting to say that. It, it, it is, there's a system of philosophy called uh, uh, the 16 enterers and abiders, and there's the, the stream enterer, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the once returner. Uh, the never returner, and then a foe destroyer, and then the and the, the stream enterer is somebody who's entering the path, and then the once returner is is somebody who has one more life to go before they attain liberation, and then there's the never returner, the one who, when they reach in this cycle and they die, then they never return, and then there's the foe destroyer, the the one who has completely overcome all delusions and, and they're, they're completely free uh, of existence so there, there is one system of Buddhist philosophy who goes through that so if you you would know that where you are on that cycle but um, I haven't heard anything about the second last one uh, so I, I don't know but the, it, the one the thing yeah, you see when, when Ma, the Theravada Buddhists think they have, they have a system of philosophy where when you break this cycle your cycle your uh, your continuum ceases 
So that, that's one school of Buddhist philosophy. They think when you break this cycle, it's like it disappears. It's like a candle being blown out. There's nothing more. So, and, I mean the last one. yeah, cool. Yeah, last up, okay. Yeah, but you, you'd know, you'd know. When you get there, could you tell me, please? <laughs> because I would really would like to know what it's like. Because I'm, I'm going to take a long time. But um, uh, but the, 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 the Mahayana school is different. The Mahayana school is saying that this is to do with existence via contaminated karma and ignorance. But there's also another type of taking rebirth, which is via the power of love, compassion, and wisdom. And that's like people like His Holiness the Dalai Lama and, and others who they keep coming back, not out of ignorance and karma, they keep coming back out of out of love for us because their whole infatuation is you and me and us. They're infatuated by us. And our suffering they want to they want to relieve it and you know, their happiness they want to give it. They're totally infatuated by the wish to help us. So they keep coming back. So what drives them into existence is not ignorance, karmic formation, craving, grasping, as, as on for us, but what, in, what their infatuation with love and compassion drives them to become reborn. So in that sense, you could say to somebody like the Dalai Lama, he, w he will never stop rebirth until all of us are free from existence. Then he will finally take a holiday. And we'll be, we can be the same as that too. We can be so. I'm sure some of you already are. I'm sure some of you, you already have developed this aspiration, and then that aspiration is a cause for you to take rebirth to help uh, living beings. Probably why you're all here, actually, not today. In some way or others, in the past, you've generated that aspiration, and so you're here now. Hello. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely I've, I've had this before. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely I've had these aspirations and this interest before. Yeah, that, that's, that's why I'm here again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and you have too. That's why you're here. I, I, bet, I bet we've had this same conversation, you and I, many times. And guess what? No, and the, the last time you were here and I was there. The guy out front just is just like a shirt you take on. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mum. <laughs> okay, good night. Take care on the way home and come back. Thanks so much.